Okay, thank you. It's good to see so many uh, undergraduates. I haven't seen so many since I was in Berkeley in the 60s, which sort of dates me. Uh, I'm glad you turned out. Um, uh, Fre Fred inadvertently uh, said something that I think we, we, much of what we will argue about today uh, is really about. He said, the Common Core is a curriculum. No, it's not. It's called the Common Core State Standards and they're voluntary. Um, here's this infernal document. It's pretty thin, actually. This is from K to 12 math and English language arts. So, no, nobody can hear me? Is it just I'm not close enough? Yeah, not close enough. Yeah. Not close enough, okay. So here's the actual infernal document. It's, it's about 120, 130 pages for K to 12. 13 grades, half of it is math, half of it is English language arts. This is physical evidence that it can't be a curriculum. A curriculum in two subjects, which details all the things, all the knowledge that uh, kids in that, in, in that particular grade should know and master week by week through a 10-month uh, uh, school year, you would have to have a pile of books here, this time maybe reaching to the ceiling. So physically, it's literally impossible that this is a curriculum. It's not called a curriculum. In fact, I would argue, I wish it was a curriculum. This has some, become some sort of a bugaboo. God forbid we should have a curriculum for America, like France does, like Israel does, like many other European countries do. It's precisely the lack of a grade-by-grade -grade curriculum, which we did once have in America. It's the lack of that. It's the conquest of the, of the education system, of the uh, ed schools. I'm, I'm not familiar with St. Francis, and I'm not saying it's prevalent everywhere. But in general, it's pretty well understood that beginning with John Dewey in the 30s, progressives moved into uh, a, a sort of conquered, conquered education. And uh, by the 1960s, uh, they had effectively taken curriculum out of the schools. What you had instead were various progressive theories about how kids learn, starting in kindergarten, first grade, downplaying of, of, of phonics uh, in English language arts, something called whole language, where the assumption was a kind of romantic assumption going back to Dewey, going all the way back, if you will, to Rousseau, that kids can learn on their own, that the teacher should no longer be, and literally this is a direct quote, and, uh, and it was used in many ed schools, teachers should no longer be a sage on the stage, the teacher in the classroom should be a guide on the side. Well, Americans kind of woke up by the middle, by the early and mid, mid 80s and realized that the bottom had fallen out of what was once a very uh, strong education system. I mean, the United States did very well in international comparisons up until the 60s. They weren't as sophisticated as they are today, but we certainly weren't 20th or 25th in the world among industrialized countries as we are today. SAT, people woke up to the fact, SAT scores, beginning in the 60s, plummeted severely for at least a, de a decade and decade and a half, and then leveled off, but in ne they never grew again. They never went up again. We kind of had, we hit a kind of stagnation. And as Fred mentioned, the Reagan administration, you know, that awful right-winger conservative, created uh, the Secretary of Education, created a commission called uh, A Nation at Risk. It tried to get it uh, to understand what, what happened. And they documented, the commission came out with its report with some very dramatic language, what's happened to the United States is the equivalent in education, it's the equivalent as if we suffered an attack from a foreign power. It's that serious. I think they exaggerated to some extent. 
But they, they did understand that something drastic, I mean, they, they understand, something drastic had to be done. I mean, uh, you can't keep doing the same thing and failing every year if you, care about, if you care about the country, if you care about the future, if you care about, about uh, uh, young people. And th this set off basically three to four decades of, quote, school reform. We tried everything. As Fred said, the right, the conservatives pushed for more competition in the school system. The idea is that the schools have become a kind of monopoly, and monopolies are notoriously ineffective in, de in delivering services. They, without competition, they're not, these ins monopolistic institutions are not prompted to deliver service as well. And so conservatives, believing in the free market, I was one of them, I still am in some sense, push for the idea of more competition. This will get the, class, the uh, kids to do better. Give, them a, give parents a choice, give them vouchers, uh, charter schools, tuition tax credits. The left, on the whole, uh, argued the progressives, the left uh, it argued it's, the problem is resources, we need more money. Kids come into school poor, Part of the problem is poverty. We have to create wraparound services in the schools. A lot of that was tried. Others, uh, several foundations pushed for smaller schools, particularly in the high schools. Let's convert these big ma factory schools into smaller schools. Well, 30, 40 years later, we discovered none of it worked. And I admit I was wrong. I said vouchers would probably produce results. They haven't. Milwaukee, the longest uh, running voucher system in the country, 20 years. Minority kids in Milwaukee today have the lowest NAEP scores, that's National Association for Education, National Assessment of Education Progress, the federal gold standard test. After 20 years of vouchers in Milwaukee, minority kids in Milwaukee have the lowest NAEP scores in the country. So that didn't work. Well, there was another proposal. There was another trend out there, mostly ignored. And um, uh, Fred mentioned the name of E.D. Hirsch. I don't know if in your classes in the ed school you read uh, any of E.D. Hirsch's books. I certainly think you should, because in my view, starting with cultural literacy in 1985, 87, a few years after the Nation at Risk report, Hirsch laid out not just a theory, but back really something serious, backed by consensus science and, cog and cognitive science and neurolinguistics, a analysis of what, of what went wrong. What went wrong is the ed schools, what I just said, were taken over by the progressive. They abandoned the idea of knowledge. Now, knowledge is important in its own right for citizenship. If, as a recent test showed, a NAEP test showed, uh, over 60% of American high school graduates, or just in their senior year, 60% couldn't identify the half century in which the Civil War was fought. We're in trouble. So we need it for good citizens. The Founding Fathers, one of the things I say in here that I know some will find controversial is that uh, the Founding Fathers would have liked this document. The Common Core Standards, because they emphasize the idea of going back to understanding the documents, uh, the traditions that made America great. And if kids don't understand that, they can't be good. But one other connection that's very important. Hirsch was able to see that the abandoning of a core knowledge, of a common, of a core knowledge, knowledge-based curriculum, leads directly to reading uh, failure. It's not enough to teach reading by skills. He was able to establish, again, on citing consensus science, that essential to reading understanding by eighth grade was background knowledge. You had to know, know something to be able to read something. The example he gives is, you know, you could have a great, great readers, and they give them, you give those great readers, technically great readers, a column from an English newspaper on cricket, they wouldn't be able to understand it. Similarly, if 
here's a given text, complicated text about history, the Civil War, etc. If they don't have the background knowledge, the vocabulary, they will fail in reading. This is the single bi biggest aspect of the crisis. We have kids reaching eighth grade and uh, then twelfth grade who are semi-literate. They can't read. We once knew how to teach kids how to read in this country, and we can't. So all through this period, 40 years of failure, and of one proposal or another, there was this other trend that was never seriously discussed. Hirsch was regarded as an interloper by the ed schools. His ideas were not taken seriously. They did. He created a, a foundation which, which created about a thousand schools, very successful schools that focused on core knowledge around the country, but basically he was dis disregarded. But all along there were conservatives in Washington, people like William Bennett, Diane Ravitch, who's a neighbor here, who used to be a conservative, it's no longer, and uh, Cheka Finn of the Fordham Institute, that pushed the idea that we, we haven't tried this one other possibility a combination of national standards and um, content knowledge. And because of that, and because the No Child Left Behind had basically been seen to fail, there was a movement in uh, establishment education circles to give this a national standards uh, a, a chance. National Governors Conference, Association of Chief School Superintendents got together, they created a consortium, they came out with this document. Is it a perfect document? No. The Constitution wasn't a perfect document. It's a question of implementation, of amendment. But what it does have, in my view, what makes it potentially a tremendous breakthrough, is that it recognizes, for the first time, it recognized the absolute importance of a content-based curriculum. Does that mean this is a curriculum, as Peter will, will say, or Fred inadvertently said? No, it's not a curriculum. It can't be a curriculum. And I challenge Peter, if he argues it's a curriculum, show me the curriculum. Show me somewhere. In New York City today, 1,500 schools, no two school. I mean, there, there are four or five different curriculum for, and some are not even doing a curriculum. There isn't a state in the country that as a result of this document has adopted a single K-12 curriculum. I think they should. In my view, they should adopt a, a core knowledge-based curriculum. They haven't done so. But the document it does have this extraordinary paragraph in it which makes it clear we're not a curriculum. It says, while the standards make reference to some particular form of content, including mythology, foundational U.S. documents, and Shakespeare, they do not, indeed cannot, enumerate all or even most of the content that students should learn. The standards must therefore be complemented by a well-developed, content-rich curriculum consistent with the expectations laid out in this document. Now, there's a lot of talk about federal imposition. The feds are imposing this on the schools. The reality is that the feds have done nothing. There is no imposition of a curriculum. New York State is arguing, debating the different districts what curriculums to use. The State Education Department has put several curriculums on its website. The federal government has played absolutely no role in it. I wish it would. I wish there was a consensus in this country, as there was for a while in France. By the way, they dropped their standards and national curriculum because the progressives took over eventually in France, and France dropped th through the floor as well. Education results, you know, declined in, in France. But I wish there were. I wish we had a now. Now it's, now it's true. Federal education law says the feds cannot impose a curriculum. It's a law. It's not in the Constitution. The Constitution doesn't mention education. Laws can be amended. I would say they should, it should be amended. I would say we should have a consensus about what kids in this country should know. Whether you grow up in Lubbock, Texas, or in Brownsville, all kids by eighth grade should have some basic knowledge about this country, about science, 
uh, I know we are. And so that's why I'm in favor. Because of that paragraph, I see a potential. Will it happen? I'm not sure. But it's worth trying because, and this is the, uh, the, the onus is on those who oppose it, particularly on the conservative side. What do you propose instead? What have you proposed that's worked over 40, not you, Peter Woods, but you, conservative movement? What have you been for for the last 40 years that gives any hope of dealing with this problem that, as Fred mentioned, this is the dumbest, and I'm, I'm, I hope I'm not insulting you people out there. I'm sure you're all very bright. But as Fred says, in terms of the, uh, the, the tests that we have, all the indications are this generation knows less than any other previous generation. They just don't know enough. And so they won't be good citizens, and they won't be good readers. We have to attack that problem. Thank you. I love having this discussion with Saul. And Saul has uh, thrown down a particular gauntlet about the curriculum. Before I pick that gauntlet up, let me do the uh, debaterly thing of saying, there's a lot here on which Saul and I agree. And let me run through some of what that is. He's given a history of how we got to the situation that we're currently in. And I agree with most of that. I believe that progressive ideology laid out by Dewey and quite a few other thinkers starting actually in the 1880s has led to a uh, unhappy situation with American schooling. Much of that does take the form of preferencing the uh, pedagogical theory and teaching technique over particular content. And there has been a long and I think well-documented account of how that has brought down our standards over a period of uh, the last 50 years or so. There are other factors in there besides the progressive movement, but we don't need to go down that avenue. Uh, the plummeting of the SATs starting in the 1960s, the, a nation at risk with its uh, dire uh, prognosis that it had been as if a foreign enemy had taken us over and imposed on us a school system that was so bad that it could be considered a declaration of war. All of that I take right in stride as a pretty accurate description of what happened. As to the uh, wave of reform efforts that followed a nation at risk, uh, that most of them came a cropper, I'd agree with that as well. The voucher movement, charter schools, uh, efforts to pump more and more money into schools, smaller school movement. None of those have really gotten to the essence of the problem that we have, which is that American K-12 education does not perform well, either by American standards or by international benchmarks. Um, where I begin to have some trepidation over Saul's account of things is with uh, E.D. Hirsch's publication of Cultural Literacy in 1987. I read it when it came out. It was a mildly impressive book, but it was really a call for essentially making sure that students had superficial knowledge because they needed that to read. Uh, it was a utilitarian argument. It wasn't knowledge for knowledge's sake. It was learn a bit about history in order so that you can understand at a superficial level other material. Now, Hirsch has been a stalwart of this idea um, and pretty much uncompromising on it until the Common Core came along, and then the, uh, his foundation decided to amend what uh, is the content of his core knowledge to make it uh, Common Core aligned. That word aligned is a, a key word in all this. Um, now, you'll note that when Saul is telling this story, uh, it gets very abbreviated at the end. It's that nothing worked until the Common Core came along, and because the Common Core combines, and I'm going to use his words here, a combination of national standards and core knowledge. Um, elsewhere, we're told that this thing is not national. It's a state-led thing. But right there, the word national slips back into it. OK. Uh, some of you may be familiar with that surrealist painting by Magritte that shows a, a picture of a pipe. And in French, underneath the pipe are, is a legend that says, this is not a pipe. That's pretty much what we get with the Common Core. This is not a curriculum, it says. And in every other way, it is a curriculum. Now, 
I wish I'd known that Saul was going to bring the pamphletized sides of the Common Core with him. I would have brought a little red wagon stacked yo high with all the supplementary pieces that spell out what these uh, curricular standards in that brief version of it actually look like. The Common Core is an industry. It has produced mammoth volumes of material, not just this little pamphlet. If you want to find out what's in the Common Core, set aside a good month or two and start going through it, and you'll begin to get the sense that this is a lot more than what we would ordinarily think of as a set of standards. Now, I want to be careful in answering this. I don't think that there is a hard and fast, bright line between the word standards and the word curriculum. They both mean something similar. Standards implies that you're just giving the broad outline. Curriculum can mean, and Saul has used it this way, something down to the level of the syllabus that says exactly what we're doing on every day of class for the next semester. Well, the Common Core doesn't do that. There is something in between the classroom syllabus and the outline of broad standards. That something in between may lack a clear name, but I would say the Common Core is a lot closer to being a curriculum than it is being a mere set of standards. Now, um, this being an educational setting, it seems to me a, a good time to engage in some uh, literary study myself. I would like to uh, recall to your mind that uh, famous literary classic, Jack and the Beanstalk. Now, uh, it may be a while since you've read that in your college classes, so let me refresh you as to what happens. Jack and his poor widowed mother are pretty much out of luck. Their one cow that had been giving them milk has dried up, and they decide, well, the best they can do is sell the cow for meat. So Jack is uh, seconded to go down to the market and sell the, uh, the cow, but along the way, he meets a stranger who tricks him into selling the cow for a handful of magic beans. And Jack thinks he's made a good deal. You don't get magic beans every day. But uh, his mom is not very pleased with this, takes the beans and throws them out the window. Um, next morning, a giant vine has grown outside the window. And Jack, being the intrepid fellow he is, climbs the vine goes up way into the clouds where he discovers a castle full of a bunch of giant people. One of them is a clearly no good giant who announces himself with a, uh, a little rhyme. He goes something like this. Fee, fi, fo, fum. I smell a tasty curriculum. <laughs> be it English or be it math, I'll eat it all and then I'll laugh. And Jack knows he's in trouble. Now, What's going on here is that a certain deception has been perpetrated on Americans. And if I'm asked briefly what is wrong with the core curriculum, I would say it's founded on deception, not just one deception, but a bunch of deceptions. But we'll start with the one that Saul has, has called out, that the Common Core is not a curriculum. In fact, you go to the Common Core, it says in many, many places, not a curriculum. It has a briefing page to people who support the Common Core telling them how they should talk to the public about it. And the first briefing point is always say it's not a curriculum. If you go into the Common Core documents, this motto is everywhere. We are not a curriculum. Why do they insist so much that it's not a curriculum? That, that's a question to wrestle with. They're attacking them all the time as being a curriculum. That's <laughs> why they insist. OK. Sorry, I, that was out of protocol. Okay. All right. I think what's at stake in saying that it's a curriculum versus a set of standards is the sense that Americans have that the curriculum is something that's fairly dear to the local community. And the local community may be a state, but it's certainly a school district. It's certainly the teacher as well who wants to feel some sense of autonomy and control over what is taught in the classroom. So the question that, that really lies behind whether this thing is a curriculum or not is how much intellectual freedom do we have to modify it? Now, Saul's view is a lot. Um, my view in reading through this is not so much. And what lies behind my view is that the Common Core isn't just a set of standards written down on paper. It is tied to a set of national tests. There's two testing consortia. I could get lost in the weeds here pretty quickly, but one of them is called PARC and the other is called SBAC. 
if you take the Common Core in a school in the United States, you're going to be tested by one or, or the other of those two things, or you may be in a state that is now trying to pair itself out of these testing consortia. But basically, we're in the same situation we were with No Child Left Behind. The Common Core is closely aligned with a set of tests. Now, it's aligned with those tests both within the K-12 system, but it's now also aligned with the SATs because the man who created the Common Core, David Coleman, then became head of the, uh, uh, right, the college board, thank you. And, uh, and taking that job in 2012, he promised to make the SATs Common Core aligned. So what we're ending up with here is call it a curriculum or not call it a curriculum, it's certainly a funnel that is pushing us all down the path to a very uh, well-prescribed set of things that you're going to learn or not learn depending on where you are in this. Now, I want to stick with the theme of deception, which is, means I'm going to have to stop on the curriculum thing for a moment and talk about a few of these other things. Is this a state project or is it a national project? Well, David Coleman, hats off to his cleverness, he realized he couldn't get a national project, so he and his fellows took it to the National Governors Association and the Council of Chief State School Officers in 2008 and said, hey, we can work around this being a national project by getting all the states to line up with it in advance. 46 of them did. That is, there was no common core at that point. This is 46 states saying, yeah, we like the idea. We don't care what's in there. We've not seen it. We aren't going to see it for a few years, but we'll sign on to it right now. Um, it became a national project then in a sort of theoretical way, 46 states. It was uh, Texas, Minnesota, I forget what the other two were. But something then happened that bears very much on this story of whether it's national or not. We had the 2008 election. We had the market meltdown, the housing bubble the great financial collapse that put every state in the country into a dire situation. President Obama was elected. The Congress passed in early 2009 the, what became known as the Stimulus Act. Vast amounts of money were put forward in favor of what was labeled shovel-ready projects. The trouble was there were no shovel-ready projects. Arne Duck Duncan, the new Secretary of Education, puts his hand up and says, Barack, I got an idea. Let's put the money into Common Core. So overnight, with very little pre-planning, the federal government announced a program called the Race to the Top with something like 3.6 billion, I believe that was the number, uh, put out 15.8 billion, there it is, uh, to the states if they would sign up for a set of reforms that were in every possible way specified as the Common Core without naming the Common Core. So they described the Common Core, said, if you sign up for this and commit yourselves to it, you have a chance to get a piece of this $15.8 billion. 18 of the states were going to get the money, but all of them had to sign up in order to get a lottery ticket for this money. Um, the end result of this is that states still not having seen the content of the core, not having any idea what it was actually going to involve, committed themselves to this project in order to get bailed out from their financial woes from the 2008-2009 recession. Now, there is again a word that I keep coming back to, deception here. What do you call it when you go out and commit your state to a vast expenditure that's meant to last for many years to come without having seen what it is. I call it deception. A phrase that frequently comes up in a common core apologetics is that this thing is supposed to be internationally benchmarked. That is, nothing in the common core is going to be worse than what's being taught in Switzerland or Japan or Singapore. It's a plain out and out lie. The thing was never internationally benchmarked. It's just a phrase that the advocates like to toss around. There is nothing in the Common Core that references or in any way acts upon the differences that other nations use that have better K-12 education systems than we do. 
internationally benchmarked seems to mean, yeah, we know other nations do things in a different way, but we aren't going to do it that way. Um, the Common Core has a motto. It says, college and career ready, or career and college ready. That is, the Common Core is meant to make sure that students who graduate from K-12 education in this country will be ready for college. How does it go about doing that? Well, now we know. There's two ways to make the Common Core align with college. One would be to raise the standards so that students finishing it are really ready for college. The other is to put pressure on colleges to make sure they dumb down their admissions enough to let students in who've suffered through the Common Core. And that's the choice that the Common Core has opted. When the states were pressured into signing up for the Common Core, they agreed to a stipulation that any student passing the Common Core or pa passing a Common Core aligned high school curriculum would be admitted to any state college in that state without having to take remedial courses. So in a stroke, remediation was done away with. It meant that if you finished with a high school degree and could get into a state college, you were ready for every course that was to be taught there. That's a lie. That's a deception. We know that because, for example, in California, 50% of the students who finish high school and go to college now have to take remedial courses. Overnight, the Common Core says, nope, you're completely ready. You can take the regular courses that everybody else takes. The Common Core sells itself on higher standards. And on this, I want to reference a particular text. Uh, back in 2007, before the Common Core had a name, I'm almost out of time here, David Coleman published a short, I have four minutes, um, published a short document in which he laid out what his vision of education reform should look like. And it was a, uh, a document titled Math and Science Standards that are fewer, clearer, and higher to raise achievement at all levels. That's a wonderfully uplifting phrase, fewer, clearer, higher. Who wouldn't want that? Um, and that wonderful phrase found its way directly into the Common Core. So did the logic of his paper. Fewer, clearer, higher standards in math, in science, and eventually in English. The word to look out for is higher. Fewer and clearer, fine. The Common Core, fewer standards than the proliferation of standards in 50 states. Yep. Clearer, in many cases they are. They're quite lucid. Higher? No. What he meant by higher, and he was candid enough in this paper to lay it out plainly, was that if you set the standards low enough, higher numbers of people will pass them. Now, that's pretty darn logical. If you set it down at a knee-high level, everybody can step over them. If you set it at waist-high, only some people are going to be to step over them. So higher standards became synonymous with more people passing. Higher means higher people pass not higher intellectually, not higher pedagogically, not better readings, not better books, not more ideas, not better ideas, just higher numbers of people passing achieved by means of lowering the standards. That was the plan in 2007. That's what got written into the DNA of the Common Core. Now, to this day, you will find the advocates of the Common Core swearing up and down that this is higher standards. They're internationally benchmarked, my goodness. They're making people college ready. It's nonsense. These standards have been knocked down to the basement in order to have more people pass. More people passing means higher people passing. Therefore, the standards are higher. If you buy that, I have some magic beans for you. Look, I, what I want to do, is I want, I want to, I, I want to put the, the, the curriculum issue directly to, to Peter. I want you to name the curriculum that you say is being imposed on all of these schools. What's the name of it? You, you mentioned, you said this was a deception because it's a pamphlet. This is the Common Core document. This is exactly what the Common Core standards are. It's all in a, the, what, what did you call it? A little red wagon of books that you could have brought in? It has nothing to do with the Common Core. These are publishers, yes. You could have brought in, a, you know, you could have, you could have brought in some books by Pearson. And Pearson is claiming that it's producing uh, Common Core aligned material. Explain who Pearson is. Pearson is the biggest education publisher in the world. It's, it's a huge conglomerate. 
And uh, it's in many ways an awful company, it's true. And they, they hustle their wares, and of course, this is a reality. Once you have uh, standards and uh, there's supposed to be a curriculum aligned to it, people will come and to sell their wares. Lucy Calkins, who was the developer of, of, uh, of balanced literacy, wrote a book saying, we're really aligned to the common core. Uh, but that, 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 was, that, was, that was expected. The question is, which of these, which of these curriculums will be adopted? And here, your claim that the federal government is imposing is completely wrong. Let's look at New York City, right here. It's pretty important to look at New York City because we are suffering exactly the problem that I outlined internationally. I mean, nationally. We have a, new, uh, a mayor who took over the schools 12 years ago and uh, said we could do it all with the, uh, 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 the same budget that we have now and we're going to do all of these reforms, including school choice, vouchers, I mean, uh, uh, charter schools. And here we are 12 years later, the budget has doubled, $24 billion, and kids are still doing terrible on the SATs. There was a story in the Post the other day. Scores on SATs add up, going up. They, well, yeah, they went up a little bit for white and Asian kids, but black and Hispanic kids scored an average and had no, there had been no increase. They scored an average of a little over 1,200 SAT points on the three tests, about 400. Those are the kids that are, that are, uh, uh, t that are taking the test. So it's, you know, God knows what the, the others that don't even take the SATs. At 400, you can practically get a 400 by signing your name on a sheet. That's how bad the situation is. We are now in New York having a fight about what the curriculum should be. And there is no decision. The federal government, Arden Duncan is not coming around uh, to Carmen Farini and saying, you know, you gotta, you gotta use this curriculum and that curriculum. There's gonna be a, a fight in it. And you guys, the anti-Common Core people, are completely out of it. You wanna, you wanna, you wanna make your points about the Common Core, about deception, there's no deception. It's, that's, that's absurd. It was a, you know, everything, everything that was said in the common, uh, about the Common Core is right out, right out front. People have not been bribed. Uh, states have dropped out. You say there's a federal, uh, a federal imposition, yet you cheer every, every time there's a state that drops out of Common Core. Now we're down to about, uh, I mean, uh, about eight states have, have dropped out. If this is a federal imposition, if this was an ironclad federal mandate, you couldn't have states dropping out. So I, I think you've presented, you know, you, you, it's, a, it's a nice narrative of the beanstalk and all that. And, you know, your metaphors are very nice, but they're fa they have no facts behind it. There is no evidence. There is no evidence for your claim that this is a curriculum, because if it was, you could name the curriculum. So I began, I say, name it. Peter? Oh, yeah. uh, well, the name of it is the Common Core K-12 State Standards. Uh, but we're going to go around and around on that, and really the appeal here is to the audience to go and read this material. I assure you that Excuse what... Me, just, excuse me, let me stop one second. There's, there's a small pamphlet put out by Encounter Press. I, I don't know if your professors have talked to you about this. Uh, it's, it's the debate you've heard today. Uh, it's one of those two-sided books. Uh, yay on one side, nay, and, 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 uh, Sal, nay on the other side, Peter. And, it's, and, and I recommend it to everyone. It's, it's, I have copies of it if you want to take a look at it uh, as, as we end. I'm sorry, Peter. No, no. Um, but Saul is perfectly right that whatever this thing is, it can be filled in in different ways. You can put a uh, E.D. Hirsch common uh, core version of it out there, and people have. The uh, former commissioner, I believe, of schools, Joel Klein, Attempted to do that, um, no, he, didn't. he didn't. Okay, well, he did but the uh, the fact is that the Common Core, as it has been received across the country, is a lot more looks a lot more like a set of handcuffs than it does look like a uh, exit door from the mediocrity that we've suffered over these last few decades. But let me be more specific about that. 
if you're studying a common core K-12 curriculum, you learn long division in sixth grade. And it's been standard in this country for decades that you learn it in fifth grade, but Common Core puts it in sixth grade. Now that sounds to me like a curricular decision, not a standards issue. You take algebra now in the ninth grade. Now in the past, some schools put it in the ninth grade, some put it in the eighth grade, but now nationwide, it's gonna be in the ninth grade. That's a decision with consequences. If you put algebra one in ninth grade, it's really, really hard to get students to pre-calculus. So common Core standards where it says that algebra in the, uh, has to be done in the ninth grade, it can't be done in the eighth grade. I don't have them in front of me. No, so we'll, well, fine. Let it. that go. But All over New York City, schools today, some are giving in the eighth grade and some are giving, it, it's a completely bogus issue. First of all, the this New York City schools that give algebra in the, in the eighth grade, many of them find when their kids get to high school, they have to do algebra all over again because it's so, it's, it's so low level. So, so whether it's done in the eighth grade uh, at a very low level or repeated again in the ninth grade uh, at a higher level is of no consequence. And uh, nothing, nothing has really changed. Schools will give algebra either in the, some in the eighth grade and some will wait till the ninth grade. Some of the algebra given in the eighth grade will be sufficient and some won't. I know what the Common Core says. What, what does it what, say? What Where does it say that? Where does it say that? It doesn't say it has to ninth grade. If, if so, uh, every in every high school in, in, in New York would be only giving algebra. And they're not. It's just not true. Neither is it true that, uh, by the way, that, uh, that core knowledge watered down its curriculum to get, uh, you know, to, it, it didn't do anything it was of the sort. It won a contract. Core Knowledge, E.D. Hirsch's or, the organization that E.D. Hirsch started, has the same Core Knowledge curriculum in each of its 1,000 schools. And it has a K-3 to literacy program that it's put out. It was also contracted with by the state. The state, in trying to meet the, the, the Common Core Standards requirement that you develop a, a content-rich curriculum, didn't write the curriculums by themselves. They contracted with various vendors and, uh, to provide it. They contracted with core knowledge. They imposed some limitations in what core knowledge actually put in the, in the curriculum. But the original core knowledge cur curriculum was out there. Any state in the country, any district, could take the actual core knowledge curriculum from K to 12 and put it in its schools. E.D. Hirsch and for has some reason they didn't. What? They had, they, before the same, well, we, we, not, we don't know. We, we, let's wait. The fact is, in New York City, 72, 72 elementary schools are using the core knowledge curriculum right now. That's a huge leap. If you believe in the idea, if you, you know what the New York City schools eight years ago, 12 years ago, were imposing balanced literacy on every, kind every kindergarten to f uh, eighth grade class in the city, imposing it. There was a document that was sent out. You do this and this and this in your classroom. You have to have rugs in your classroom. You can't have uh, uh, posters on your classroom. You have to have stations around there. It was a progressive dictatorship here in New York City on the Bloomberg. Well, Core so knowledge now is in 72 schools. That's a huge advance. That that's a good thing. Balanced oh, literacy okay. is a, an experiment that was tried and failed, and we don't want that. I'm happy to see the uh, E.D. Hirsch approach tried out. Let it be tried out in a lot of places. But trying out the E.D. Hirsch curriculum has very little to do with whether the Common Core should be the law of the land, as it has become. The reason it's being tried out is because the state adopted a curriculum uh, as part of its obligation to fulfill, its, uh, uh, to fulfill the Common Core. That's why we have it in 72 schools. So Mr. Coleman made it happen. So, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me each ask you a question. Peter, you and Saul both agree that uh, the schools are in terrible shape intellectually. Uh, uh, it was really rather, rather, it, it's really been rather an extraordinary decline in what students know when, when mm -hmm. they graduate. Yep. What would you recommend, you're critical of the Common Core, what would you recommend as an approach to expand uh, to improve uh, the, the dismal outcomes at present? Well, 
let me um, be a little bit procedural here. I'm Common Core Nay, and I don't take it as part of that that I have to come back with my own comprehensive reform of K-12 education. But if I have to start building one, I would say we start with something like the recognition that the states and the school districts do a better job at realizing what is needed overall than our federal government is likely to do. So this does come very quickly back to the question of who's in charge of this thing. Saul thinks it's still basically local because curricula can be chosen. I'm saying this thing is in the hands of federal bureaucrats and of these private entities, uh, Smarter Balanced, Smarter Balance and uh, Park, that are completely unaccountable to the voting public and that behind them is a locomotive just as powerful as progressivism was and imposing on us its own agenda. So to me, we don't even begin to get to the threshold of real reform of K-12 education in this country until we have something like robust public interest in fixing the schools. For the 30-year the period that we've talked about in which conservatives have floundered around trying to find something that works, we still don't have anything that has really fired up public imagination that this is something we really want. Common Core isn't it. It's wildly unpopular with the public. Let me turn to you, Sal. Uh, Americans have a distrust of centralized solutions, mm -hmm. uh, enormous distrust, and, and, and a sense that the federal government, we don't have to go into the Ebola business now to understand it. the federal government from the rollout of, of, of health care standards uh, to Ebola has, has botched one initiative after another. Why shouldn't Americans be enormously uh, chary of, 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 of an incompetent federal government? Why shouldn't this be a matter of cities and states since we were a federal republic? Wouldn't it be better to recognize the federal nature of the United States to begin with and try to do this on a state level? Part of the problem with Obamacare was instead of trying it out in a few states and, and playing, with, playing with it, seeing if it worked, seeing if it didn't work, it was an attempt to, to impose something to court on the national level. Well, if, if, you use them, if, you, if you're suggesting that uh, Common Core is like the Obamacare model, you're, you're, you're wrong, as I just pointed out. Yes, there was money put behind it, Gates money came behind it, but states had the choice to either buy in or not buy in, and they are doing it all the time. Again, the contradiction. Peter, on the one hand, says, but, oh, so it is so a terrible... So let me you, 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 well, no, let, you asked the question. States and localities should be allowed to do it. They've done a wonderful job in education up till now. No. Where do you think this disaster started? It started in the states. You want to give Lubbock, the school board in Lubbock, Texas, to decide completely on every issue and every school board around the country? Do you want the Dallas uh, hospital to decide what our protocol should be on uh, treating Ebola? Is there no role uh, for, for, for us as a country, no role for the federal government, the government that we elect, to say there ought to be some minimal standards about what a kid should be able to do if he gets a, a, a high school degree in Alabama and he gets a high school degree in Minnesota? None whatsoever. And if there are, what should they be? Let's discuss it's that. all if you have a terribly polarized country. So what are you proposing, yeah, so Fred? Oh my goodness, okay. <laughs> I wasn't planning on this. I, what, I, what I would propose is, I, I'm in favor of the E.D. Hearst standards, so I'm biased in this regard. Let, let me lay this on the table. I think that the, the distrust of the federal government is so deeply ingrained at this point, and so profoundly justified. This has to be done on a state level. No. Uh, I, would be, I would be delighted if the states adopted an E.D. Hirsch curriculum. But it is being done on the state level. It is okay. not being imposed by the federal government. So, so there is not one federal officer that sat in Albany oh, and, told, and told the people in Albany and the state education department what to do in, when it came to picking curriculum, but, but which so, vendors to choose, so, which curriculums to put on their, on, on, on their uh, so, uh, Peter, site. Peter picked up when, when the stimulus money. Blessed yeah. be its name. Uh, when the stimulus money, which, we, which liberals worshipped and, and has produced, there's an old expression, borscht, nothing, very thin gruel, when it produced, produced nothing, was imposed, it, 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 it did what the federal government often does. It says, you don't have to do this, but 
here's, here's this pot of gold out here. If you don't do it, you don't get any of the gold. It started in No Child Left Behind. The yes, federal I'm government... Not, I'm, not, I'm not getting... It, they didn't start with Common Core. The federal government in No Child Left Behind created the Reading First program, yes. and it said to schools, you adopt this program, which is certified by the... So these are Republicans. The, these are, uh, these Republicans, yes. yes so terrible so Republicans both, so both did Republicans, it. Both Republicans and Democrats have attempted to use federal money to impose a national... And by the way, you know how much federal money the state, the New York State, got because it signed on to Common Core? A couple of hundred million dollars. It doesn't even pay for the transition. It True. doesn't pay for the it many things. So the states didn't do it for the... For the you can make an argument that the total race to the top with all the other aspects of it, you know, steered, it steered, it steered some, some districts towards uh, being more friendly to charter schools. So uh, there's another thing that, uh, and the Republican, I, I, didn't, I didn't notice that the uh, 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 right-wing uh, education reformers were screaming and hollering, the federal government is giving money to, uh, to charter schools. They love charter schools. They want to expand charter schools. So it's a question of whose axe is being gored, you know? May I take up the, the thing that Saul's brought up twice now about states dropping out, and therefore it's not mandatory? Part of No Child Left Behind was a stipulation that by 2013, I believe was the year, uh, every student in the country... Two four, 2014. 2014. Right now. Right now uh, had to be... Do you remember the phrase there? Yes, uh, proficient. proficient. Have a in rooster math. level of proficiency in all in in math, in math and reading in all grades. Right, kind of utopian. This was a complete impossibility. Everybody uto- knew that it was, but it was the law, and every state is now under penalty of this law if they don't meet that standard. They stand to Not lose true. substantial federal funding, except that the Department of Education created for itself. A new power, never envisaged in any law, because they that had grants to waivers to the states if they find themselves not meeting the No Child Left Behind law. The No Child Left Behind law is enormously useful to the Department of Education now because it gives them an extra procedural power. That power is relevant to this story because when Indiana tried to drop out of the Common Core, the first thing they did was get a letter from Arne Duncan saying, if you drop out of the Common Core, I'm going to take your waiver away. And that's the coercion that you uh, get from the federal government. And they're using that power over and over again. But Indiana know. did drop out. And what do they have now? What do they have now in Indiana? They, they dropped the out. Com- they took the yeah. name yeah, yeah, because off they the Common did, Core yes, and left because, the Common because Core. Because they realized they didn't have anything better. That's why. And because the previous standards weren't working. Not only weren't they working, but the previous standards in Indiana and many states weren't even followed weren't even followed by schools. When my kids went to uh, the public schools in this city, there were state standards. But there was no following of those standards in the schools. My, my two sons went to Stuyvesant High School. Their English department, every course they took in English, the professor, the teacher in the course decided what they were gonna cover. They had one teacher that wanted, you know, that uh, they decided we're gonna, we're gonna read hippie literature all year. Uh, uh, and sure and another thing, yeah, it was trying. So there were no, the standards didn't work at all. So you, you're arguing, there was nothing there before this. I just want to make one point. The problem with your analysis is that the decline in SAT scores that were, uh, that started in the 60s happened in, er- in areas of the country in which you didn't have these problems, in which it was a homogeneous, mostly middle class population. Iowa's, Iowa's, Test scores went down. They didn't get a huge influx in Iowa of, of, uh, of dysfunctional families. Test scores went down because there was less being taught. That's when test scores go down, when you don't teach, when you don't teach content, when you teach, in effect, saying the children can construct their own knowledge, which is unfortunately what most education schools are promoting still. So in other words, you're saying these, uh, these uh, Average SAT scores of four, about 400 in each of the sections for black and Hispanic children in New York City. Well, if we just give them massive test prep, it'll come up 100 points. There's also a direct correlation between the income of families and the uh, level of knowledge they come into when they start school. Yes. Middle class kids come in with a huge vocabulary and huge level of knowledge. Minority poor kids don't, which is precisely why we have to start using the schools to teach Again, content knowledge, which worked when 
uh, immigrant children came to the city in the, in, in, in the end of the 19th century, in the 20s and 30s, and the schools were, were agents of mobility and raised children up to, to, into, the, into the middle class. Yeah, let me just a, a quick answer to this. Um, I certainly agree with you that there are many causes to the troubles that our schools have, and uh, internationally benchmarking them does one thing of pointing out what some of those troubles are. Uh, it's not all a matter of uh, progressive education theory pushing out a better curriculum, although I do think that Saul's right that that was a significant component of this. To get this back to the common core, um, when David Coleman first proposed this, uh, his sole reason for proposing it was to close the racial achievement gap. So the Common Core itself is founded as an answer to this question. Coleman, as far as I know, has never had anything to say about changes in the family structure or immigration or matters like that. But this is supposed to be an answer to the achievement gap. It's important though when we talk about these things, we, we talk about in aggregate. In other words, in, there are individual cases that will show up all over the map. But I want to come back to something that Saul said for a second. I, I went to grammar school in New York in the early 1950s. Uh, the school I went to had no, no visual uh, props. There, were no ma there was nothing. It was a plain classroom on the Lower East Side of New York. Uh, uh, half the kids in the class uh, came from families, well, well, all, while intact, had no interest in education whatsoever because the assumption was they, the kids would go to work on the docks. In those days, there was an almost guaranteed job on the docks. Uh, and yet, the kids came out of second and third grade with certain basic knowledge of geography, of state. I mean, I know state capitals are boring, uh, but we knew the state capitals in third grade. We, we, this one, we went around the class, we drilled, where, where are all the state capitals, where are the states? And I'm going to tell a brief story, then I'll open it up for questions again. I, for many years, taught at, at Cooper Union. The, the, you, you all know Cooper Union in Manhattan. Cooper Union, everyone is on full scholarship. Everyone is double 700 in SATs. Very nice kids, very bright kids. And every year, I give a, uh, a lecture on... on uh, uh, Lincoln's Cooper Union address. And because it's at Cooper Union, I give the, I give the lecture in the hall where, where Lincoln spoke, at the podium where Lincoln spoke. And as I'm speaking, I, I try to set this up. I talk about the Lincoln-Douglas debates in 1858. What was this about? What was, what was Illinois about? They were running for center from Illinois. And how Illinois ran from Lake Michigan uh, to the Mason-Dixon line. And I look out in the class. This, this is about 2005, look out in the class, for the first time, no one knew what I was talking about. Up until then, kids, half the class would know what I was talking about. Not a single kid in the class knew where Lake Michigan was and knew where the Mason-Dixon line was. Then I got worried. I asked, where was Illinois? I got answers like, near, it's, it's near Philadelphia, or it's in Chicago. These are very bright kids and nice kids. Something had collapsed. That same year, I realized it was the first year I'd ever taught where none of my students read a newspaper. You know, I, I required that they either read the Wall Street Journal or the Times every day. You could beat them over the head with a stick. They wouldn't read. They would, simply would they'd say, I'd look at it online, <coughs> blah, blah. It didn't happen. And then I said, OK, read the Daily News or the Post. That's fine. Just have some basic sense of events in the news. That didn't, even, that didn't work either. My point is a tale of woe. Something has gone terribly wrong. I'm not sure which... which By the way, Fred, yeah. when, when all these terrible things happen in the schools that you're talking about, who, who is in control of the schools? The states, the cities, or the federal government? The state and the city. Uh-huh. So? Uh, uh, so, I'm, uh, so we were following your yes, prescription. Yes, you know, hold on for a second. Hold on for a second. The trouble with, with a federal solution, we, we, let's, let's flip it around. We, we, we began with no child left behind under Bush or Republican, and we've gone, we've gone ahead, we, we've gone ahead with, with similar kinds of changes under, under, under Obama. It, it's not a question of who's in Washington. 
It's not a question of who's in Washington. People dislike and distrust centralized solutions, regardless of their good intentions. Anyway, let, 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 me, let, me, let me stop there. And one one well, last thing. Under Bloomberg, and, and, and I've written this and Saul has written this, under Bloomberg, we had an increase in school spending which was beyond the hopes of any, any to imaginable 24. liberal. Probably $20 billion. 12 to 24. Well, I, I, we would disagree. Uh, 12 billion to 24 billion. Yeah. I, I, I think we can, we can uh, all right, 12, fine. Vast sums of increased spending on education. Nothing budged. Nothing budged. So I'm not, I'm not saying that things necessarily will work out that way. All I'm suggesting is that the distaste and distrust of the federal government at this point is so deep, so substantial. The country is so polarized. It's very hard to see how we get, how we, how we get past that. To answer the, to answer the young man's question, uh, he's getting to something important. Uh, the, he's, I think part of what you're saying is, in effect, because we have these very easy access to information, there isn't maybe that so much need for kids to build up content knowledge. It's not, it's not, not the case. The point that, that Hirsch makes, and why I think find his, his theory, theory of literacy very plausible, is that unless you have this huge, vast knowledge, background information at your fingertips, you cannot efficiently, uh, you cannot read a complicated text. If you're reading a historical text, if you're reading uh, uh, Eric Foner on the Civil War, for example, you're reading a passage from it. If you don't know going in there, as 60% of American kids, high school kids don't know, that the Civil War was fought in, 18, in the 1860s and what half century it was, you're not going to be able to follow that text. You can't all of a sudden say, oh, I'm a, I'm a little confused. Let me go to Google and find out when the Civil War was fought. It's too late. It's over. You're right. If you're, you're, you're at a party and someone challenges you, you know, to, you know when the Civil War was fought, you can, pull out, you can pull out your iPhone and find out. But that is not going to make you a better reader. Without the background knowledge, you cannot read. And our biggest crisis in education today is in reading. Math, you know, we can argue back and forth about math, but kids are doing somewhat better in math, uh, and it's not as essential. Literacy, universal literacy, is the key to everything. It's the key to our survival as a civilized society. Without literacy, we can't make it, and we don't have the literacy. Eighth graders cannot read. I think I just want to add to this that I would want to avoid a tone of blaming students or blaming young people. <coughs> a cultural change has taken place, and it's, it's very clear that has uh, altered the way in which people look for what they call information or absorb facts or relate to one another. And that's a change that any reform of higher education is going to have to take into account and uh, do something with. I don't think that the, the common core, I'm going to keep playing that fiddle, uh, is what's going to get us there. The common core talks about uh, higher order thinking skills. It emphasizes things as a key phrase, media awareness, systems thinking, creativity, collaboration. These are the new values that are embodied in the curriculum or in the standards that we're talking about. It would seem to be that that looks like it kind of meshes with a world in which uh, most people learn most of what they know by looking it up on Wikipedia or something like that. Uh, but that does leave us in this dire situation that uh, you can't read Shakespeare and you can't read Jane Austen and you can't read Herman Mel Melville. Maybe those things don't matter to you, but you're going to be missing vast dimensions of human experience if you have no access to it. And that's sort of you don't blame people for that. You have to understand that's the situation that we're now in. I think that, that question goes mostly to me since I'm one who's arguing against the Common Core. Um, I think that there is uh, a lot of knowledge that we've inherited over, one could even say thousands of years, about how to educate people, uh, that we're not applying that knowledge very well at, at the moment, seems pretty clear. But it doesn't mean that it's the common core or chaos. Uh, we can fall back on the kinds of learning that are still being practiced in various private schools and homeschooling and 
various other places where people, or adults, are saying very seriously, we've got to do something about this. There are ways to go about doing it. I can't, in a few seconds, summarize them all for you, but I can, I can give you an analogy. Uh, when uh, uh, Helena was cleaning my apartment and repeatedly breaking things, it wasn't a matter of Helena or dirt in my apartment forever and ever. Uh, I said goodbye to Helena and got Bessany, who cleans the apartment without breaking things. Uh, what happens when we don't have a core curriculum is we find something that works better. Somebody who comes in and makes things work without breaking them. Uh, find our Bessany, say goodbye to Helena. Who is this, Peter, who is this person who's gonna find out, who's gonna do something better, where? Where? In Lubbock, Texas, to go back? In I, Minnesota? I wouldn't sneer at Lubbock, everyone? Texas. I don't know what's going on in Lubbock, well, I can, but there may well be I can be tell you there. the same thing is going on <laughs> there as is going on in the hallowed halls of, of, of the Tweed Courthouse. Be, without without uh, some rich Santa, without a, a, a knowledge-based curriculum, we do go back to chaos. That's exactly the point that Hirsch made in his many books over the last 20 years that we have a fragmented, that what we have in the schools is a completely fragmented n curriculum and a chaotic approach to learning. It's, there's nothing systematic about it. It doesn't work on a grade to grade level. And, and we have examples. You say you want to look for examples other places that, where they do it. It's exactly what France did. And it had the best performance among the top performances. France had a top-down, centralized curriculum. It's true they didn't have a U.S. Constitution or federal education law. But it worked very well. Then they junked it and adopted the American model. They created 30 districts. Every district in France then figured out its own way. Guess what? Their international scores went down. And the achievement that they had, the... the Narrowing of the achievement gap between the middle class and the poor, the, band, the, the kids who came out of the Ban Louise, that began to evaporate. So we have a real life experiment in France and similarly in Sweden. Hirsch has a book coming out about these two examples. We have real life experiments of countries that did very well with a national curriculum where every kid in the country at 10 a.m. was studying, was learning about Charlemagne and what happened after they abandoned it. Uh, so evidence does count in these issues. I, I, didn't, I didn't say that the, the Common Core standards are, are content rich. They are not content rich. They're not intended to be content rich because there's very little content in them, okay? What the standards do call for, if you're, the paragraph I read is that the standards must be implemented with a content rich curriculum. However, the standards do have lists. They have, in each grade, they have lists of exemplar texts. And what you're saying about not reading Ivanhoe is just not true. All of the classics, almost all of the classics, are on these, are on these exemplar texts. It doesn't mean the, the standards say, in, implement, in implementing standards, you have to teach these texts in the school. They, these are examples of the kind of texts. As to the informational issue, this is a very important part I I issue. It's, it, I it is controversial. The Common Core does say that kids should also read, in addition to liter uh, 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 fiction, what, what are called informational texts. And I think there's nothing wrong with that. We all, we all read informational texts. The inability to read, when we say an informational text, we might mean, for example, uh, the Federalist Papers. It's not fiction, it's information, it's a debate. I, well, I'll, I'll try on that. I, for sure, I don't know. The, but but we, we do know a few relevant facts. There was a, a Intercollegiate Studies Institute was doing a, a test of what students knew and they took it to the Ivy League. I remember at Yale, they found that after four years of a Yale education, students knew less US history than uh, the average high school graduate did. So the answer is that certainly the decline in cultural literacy, as Hirsch would call it, affects everybody, including the Ivy League. No doubt when you take the brightest of brightest students and line them into Princeton and Yale and Harvard, uh, many of them are going to be of capacious enough mind and enough curiosity that they will have filled in a lot of gaps that they weren't taught. 
that's just how people are. We're not talking about the outliers on the uh, uh, bell curve of people who are so bright that they're going to absorb vast amounts of knowledge without even trying. We're talking about what happens to most people in this country. But uh, certainly the cultural problem we're talking about of a general loss of uh, knowledge of our civilization's past and of its the complexities of the present is, is everywhere. And it affects us all in many ways. And uh, that's a, a sorry situation. Having some striving towards standards, whether they're national or international or whatever, is going to be part of the answer. I don't want to be misunderstood as saying I'm against standards. But where those standards come from, who's in charge of them, how they are enforced, that's a different set of questions. Let me, let me, let me thank you for, for coming. I, I, uh, thanks. I hope we have a follow-up on this um, in January. Uh, I think this, this subject is not going away. Uh, people are genuinely worried about the future of the country in these terms. And hopefully we'll have something intelligent to say about it down the road. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you.